So how are we doing this morning, church? Good? I love how the children are some of the best singers we have. Don't you think so? Yeah, yeah I bet you do. Yeah. All right, I'm just going to uh, say a quick, quick word of prayer, and uh, then we'll dive into the Bible. Lord God, I just, once again, Lord, I just thank you for, I just thank you that we were able to do this. God, um, I just pray, Lord, that you would be able to speak through me. And Lord, I pray that, uh, yeah, I, I, I pray, Lord, that, that if there's anything of you, just fall on dull ears and, and the rest, Lord, that I pray that your word would go out and it would not return to you void. Thank you, Lord. So my, the title for my message today is, I see that you are very religious, but I'm not sure if that's a good thing. So the, the text that I'm going to be preaching from today is Acts 17, verses 16 through 34. That's Acts 17, verses 16 through 34. And so kind of the way I like to preach is, is I'll read you the verse completely out of context, and then we'll dive in and we'll see, uh, we'll see what the Lord decides to speak to us. Okay, so starting at verse 16, it says, Now, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens... Actually, you know what? Just give me one second. What's that? That's right, yeah. Okay, so uh, we're going to Acts chapter 17, verses 16 through 34, and I'll try and find it in my Bible again. Yeah. All right, Acts 17, 16 through 34. So the verse says, Now while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was being provoked within him as he was observing the city full of idols. So he began reasoning in the synagogue with the Jews and the God-fearing Gentiles, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be present. Some Epicurean and Stoic philosophers were conversing with him. Some were saying, what would this idle babbler wish to say? Others said, he seems to be a proclaimer of strange gods, because Paul had been preaching Jesus and the resurrection. So they took him and brought him to the Areopagus saying, may we know what this new teaching is which you are preaching, for you are bringing some strange things to our ears. So we want to know what these things mean. Now all the Athenians in the city and the strangers visiting there used to spend their time in nothing else but telling and hearing new things. So Paul... So Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus, and he said, Men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, 
I also found an altar with, the, with this inscription, to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, but rather, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to, to live on all the face of the earth, having predetermined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitations, that they would seek after God, if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us, for in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. Being then the children of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is gold or silver or stone, an image that's formed by the art and the thought of a person. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God has now declared to men that all people everywhere should repent because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof of all men by by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some of them began to sneer, but others said, we would hear you again concerning this matter. So Paul went out of their midst, but some of the men joined him and believed, among whom also were Dionysius, the Arapagite, and a woman named Damaris, and others like them. So, the topic that we're dealing with is religion and faith. But there's a couple things we need to, we need to understand. So, Paul is in Athens. A couple things we need to know about Athens. Athens is, um, Athens is a city of education. So, this is like a university city. This is where all the Bible scholars, the theologians, the philosophers, this is where they want to be. This is where they gather. Athens, Athens was basically, it was, it was based on, uh, there was two hills in Athens. So if you lived in Athens and you walked out of your house, you would see two things. You would see the Areopagus, also known as the Hill of Ares. And it had another name, and it was called Mars Hill, because Mars is the Roman word for Aries. And it was rumored that on this hill, um, in, in Greek mythology, uh, Ares murdered one of uh, Ares murdered Poseidon's son for attacking Ares' daughter. And according to Greek mythology, the gods took Ares, they came down to this hill that the Greeks call the Hill of Ares, or, the, or Mars Hill, and according to Greek mythology, they had a trial for Ares for, for murdering uh, Poseidon's son, and of, to which they came to the conclusion that they would acquit Ares for various, various reasons. So in Paul's day, the hill of Ares is where the Greeks, because they were based out of their Greek stories and Greek mythology, they would, have tri they would have murder trials on this hill because of the story of, of Ares. And so they would actually have mur murder trials, ho homicides on this hill, and they would, also conduct the, they would also conduct business for the city on top of this hill. Because for them, this hill was, was kind of like a sacred space, it was a sacred area. And there is another hill that you would see if you would walk out of your house if you lived in Athens. And this hill was called uh, the, Necro the Necropolis. I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly. On the top of the Necropolis, on top of this hill, was the Parthenon. 
And this was the temple of Athena. So you imagine this. Every time you leave your house, you see these two hills. The city is literally in the shadow of Athena. It's in the shadow of this temple that's dedicated to, uh, to one, of the Greek, one of the Greek gods. Now, for those of you who are taking notes, write down this two words, cosmic geography. Cosmic geography. So cosmic geography is an Old Testament belief that gods owned land. And if a human lived in their country, the god owned them. And this idea, there's actually a, uh, there's actually a lot of talk in the Old Testament about land, because land and gods were really important to the Israelites. One of the reasons why the Israelites were entitled by God to go and take the promised land was because Canaan belonged to Yahweh. And so Yahweh had the ability and the right to give it to whoever he sees fit. But the problem is, in order to take land, humans needed to have a god more powerful than the god that, that was in the land. This is actually why a lot of people misunderstand a lot of Old Testament stories. For example, in Exodus, people think that when God, um, when God releases the Israelites from Pharaoh, God didn't just do 10 plagues to show how powerful he was. Like, he wasn't bragging and trying to one-up Pharaoh, although that was probably part of it. The way an ancient Israelite would have read the book of Exodus and the 10 plagues, each plague corresponds with a, a different Egyptian god. And so what they understood, there was a God of the Nile. And so when Moses goes out and he lifts up his rod and the Nile turns to blood, what they're seeing is our God is fighting the Egyptian God of the Nile. So this is like a warrior thing. My God is bigger than your God. And so this is what the entire, this is what all 10 of the plagues are about. When, when they see the plagues, what the Egyptians see and what the Israelites see is Yahweh is going to war with the pagan gods. And he's winning, by the way. And by defeating the pagan gods, God can then bring his people out of his land and take them into Canaan, which belongs to Yahweh. So now we have Paul. This is, how, this is part of the Apostle Paul's worldview. Now, here's the thing. When Paul goes to Athens, Paul believes there is a principality or a spirit, or some of us would use the word demon, in charge of different cities. And this is actually echoed in the book of Daniel. In, in Daniel chapter 10, 11 through 13, Daniel is praying for God. To, he, he's, he's asking God for help and to move because he's... He's, he's just cut to the spirit. And he prays for 28 days, and then all of a sudden, the angel Gabriel shows up. And the angel tells Daniel, I, the moment you started praying, the Lord released me with the answer. But the prince of Persia delayed me, and I had to wait for Michael to come and help me so that I could come to you. So the, the word that Paul uses... In Ephesians, when he says we war not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against dark powers and spiritual places, the word principality is actually the word that we understand as prince. So when, when Gabriel tells Daniel, the prince of Persia stopped me or delayed me, he's saying the principality that thinks it owns Persia fought against Gabriel. So there's spiritual warfare going on in, in the heavenly realms, and Gabriel needed help from the archangel Michael so he could break through because, because so they believe there are spiritual forces that are working in different countries and sometimes even different cities. 
And we actually see this in the New Testament. Um, in the epistles, you'll notice, when, when Paul writes his letters to the different churches, not every church has the same problems, right? In, in, in some cities, they have problems with gender, and they're not sure about their gender roles. What can men do and what can women do? In other cities, like Rome, that wasn't a problem. And when we go to Corinth, Corinth, there was a lot of sexual issues going on in the city. Now, fun fact, the patron god of Corinth was the goddess Aphrodite, the goddess of love and sex. So does it make sense that they would be dealing with those type of sins? Because that's the principality that's governing the land, that's governing the culture. So now Paul is in Athens. And the local deity of Athens is the goddess Athena. Does anybody know what Athena was the goddess of? That's good, because if you were to give me the right answer, I would have called you a bunch of sinners for, no, for, for knowing Greek mythology. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> so you're all, a, you're, you're good Pentecostals. You didn't know the answer to the Greek mythology question. You've been well educated. <laughs> or rather, actually, not educated, because you didn't have the right answer. <laughs> okay, so Athena was the Greek god of wisdom. She was the goddess of education, and she was the goddess of strategy. Now, what type of city was Athens? It was a university city. This is where the thinkers wanted to be. So it makes perfect sense that the principality over Athens was the goddess of learning, of knowledge, of wisdom, and strategy. Right? So you can see how cosmic geography works. Like, you can see there are... There are, the, the culture of the city is mirroring the spirit that is overshadowing the territory. So now Paul is invading enemy territory, okay? Paul is in Athens. Paul is in Athens, and the first thing he sees is he's, um, the, text, the text says that, um, the text says that Paul is disturbed by all of the idolatry that he sees. Uh, the, the word in Greek literally means he was stabbed in the side. So he like, like, he, he like his, he, he was gut wrenched. Like it was like, he felt like, it was like being punched in the stomach, you know? He sees all this idolatry and he's like, oh no. And the reason is there's a theological reason why Paul is so disturbed by the idolatry. We learned last week from Pastor Kevin that the principalities, they've been defeated by Christ, right? They've been defeated, they've been dethroned. Yahweh, Christ, the Savior, the Messiah, the Spirit, the, our Heavenly Father is in charge and he's bringing health and salvation back to the earth and the nations. Now, did Satan have authority in the garden? Did he have any authority in the garden? That's correct. The answer is no. He did not have authority. So what did the devil do to gain the authority? Actually, first of all, who had the authority in the garden? Other than, other than God, who had the authority? Adam and Eve had the authority. Genesis 1 says, let them have dominion over the earth, over the fish, over the cattle over the earth. And then he made them gardeners to work the earth. So mankind had the authority. The only way to get authority when you have no authority is to get the person with the authority to agree with you. That's what you do. You start talking until the person that has authority partners with you. And that's exactly what the devil does, to believe the lies, to empower the liar. And that was exactly his strategy. Now, Paul knows this. He knows that 
the principalities have no authority. But when he sees people worshiping idols, worshiping Athena, he knows Athena has no authority until you give Athena authority. So the problem that Paul is seeing by praying to these false gods, the people with authority are giving the gods or the principalities permission to rule over them. So, so this, is the, this is the problem that Paul is seeing. These defeated demonic powers are tricking the Athenians into putting them back into power. So this is, what, this is the issue that Paul's dealing with in Athens. And in the text, Paul is talking with... So immediately, Paul goes straight to the synagogue, and he says, we need to deal with this. So he starts preaching the resurrected Christ in the synagogue, and then he goes to the marketplace, and he's anybody who will listen. He's trying to proclaim Christ his crucifixion, and the resurrection. And so he gets the attention of two types of philosophers, the Epicureans and the Stoics. Now, Epicureans, these philosophers believed that God, if there's a God, like they believed there was a God that created everything, and he was all-powerful, he was omnipotent, he was omnipresent, all-knowing, but he, but, so they believed, the, the Epicureans believed that the Creator created everything, got everything going, and then left, and just left the world to its devices. So they're, they believed, yeah, there probably is a God, but he's way out there ignoring us, he doesn't really care about us, because we're just, he just set everything in motion, and just left us to our own devices and doesn't really care about what happens. The Stoic philosophers were completely different. The Stoics believed there were no gods. All that is just religious nonsense. There is no afterlife. All you have is your present life. So get as much pleasure and as much money as you possibly can because this is all you have. So. When Paul is preaching the resurrection, this is strange to the Greeks because the Greeks know dead people don't come back to life. And especially for the Stoics, they, they, they were basically like, like what, is this, what is this babbler talking about? You know, like, and, and then, and so, and here's an interesting thing. These philosophies have not died. These, both of these philosophies are alive and well. Most, most Christians are Epicurean because most Christians believe that God is way far away. He's way out there. He, they, we believe, most of us believe, God created everything. But when we think of relationship with God, most of the time we think God is in heaven and he can hear our prayers, You're right? right? He, can hear, he can hear our prayers, but most of us don't think of God as in here. Most of us, when we pray, we pray like this. We don't pray like, like this, right? And, and so a lot of Christians, I would say most Christians, are Epicurean in their philosophy of God. Most of us think he's, he's way, heaven is in a whole other world, like a whole other realm, billions of miles away, and, and, and we're so far away from him. Stoics. Modern atheists are Stoics. You see, most people don't understand. There's nothing new about atheism. This, this idea that this is all there is, the, the Greeks believe this. You know, like, like this is so, this is so old. Like some people think like this is just a new way of thinking. Like this idea is ancient. Like, there's, there's nothing new about, about these things. Okay, so here we have Paul. He's preaching the gospel to these people, and he, and he gains the attention of the philosophers, the, the seminary students, the higher learned, very, 
high intellect and very intelligent. Like, what are you talking about, Paul? Resurrection from the dead. People don't come back from the dead. Everybody knows that. And so they actually think Paul is preaching foreign gods, which he's, he's preaching foreign god, but not foreign gods. So they take Paul to the hill of Ares or to Mars Hill. And there they ask Paul to talk about what exactly he's preaching. So we're going to go back to the text here for a minute. Okay, so we are going to go, let's go to verse 26, chapter 17. Actually, let's go to verse, I changed my mind, verse 22. So Paul is on Mars Hill. It says, Paul stood in the midst of the Areopagus, of the hill of Ares, and he said, men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. For while I was passing through and examining the objects of your worship, I also found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you, the God who made the world and all things in it, since he is the Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. What can everybody in the city see? The temple to Athena. And what is the center of the Jewish culture back in Israel? The temple to Yahweh. Paul says, God does not live in temples of stone, nor is he served by human hands as if he needed anything. It is God himself who gives to all people life and breath and all things. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined their appointed times and boundaries of their habitation that they would seek God if perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. So can you, can you see what Paul is doing? Paul is challenging their philosophy of, about God because they believe if there's a God, he's far away. Paul is saying he's not far away. Paul is saying you don't even, ha- not only is God not far away, you don't have to walk 10 miles to the temple of Athena. He's saying God is so close. God made from one man, every nation of mankind, he determined where they would live in the boundaries of their habitations so that, why did God do it? So that they would seek God. If perhaps they might grope for him, And find him, though he is not far from each one of us. So he is attacking, though very cleverly, he is arguing against the Greek philosophy of God. He's saying God is not far away. God is so close you could reach out and touch him. You don't even have to walk to the temple to find God. He is so close. And what Paul is actually saying, you in your own Greek culture are getting close to God. One of the main points that I would like to get out of this sermon, that what I think God is trying to say is that God has hidden himself in every culture. He's hidden himself in culture, and it's our job as Christians to find him. Paul goes on. And he says, yeah, this is so good. 
Perhaps they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist. As even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. So this is like, we love these verses as Christians, right? Like, in him we live and move and have our being. Like that, isn't that just a beautiful picture of God? In him we live and move and have our being. We are, we are, he is the source. Every breath comes from God. Every, everything we have comes from God. Life itself flows from the source. And then this is an interesting thing. Paul uses their own poets to preach God. Paul says, so let me find it here, in verse Verse 28, for in, in him we live and move and have our being. As even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his children. So, oops. I did some fun research. And I found some of these poems that Paul actually quotes to the, Athe the Athenians. How many of you would like to hear some Greek poetry? So this, this, so the, uh, we live, okay, um, we are his children, Paul quotes, and it was, it was a man named Epimenides who, who, who wrote this. He was a Greek poet. Actually, no, first I'm going to start with Eratus. Eratus was a Greek poet, and he was a worshiper of Zeus. And he wrote, let us begin with Zeus, whom we mortals never leave unspoken. For every street, every marketplace is full of Zeus. Every sea and the harbor are full of his deity. Everywhere, everyone is indebted to Zeus, for we are indeed his offspring. Do you see what Paul did here? Do you see what Paul did? Paul took a poem that was about Zeus. And he said, this is actually true. You, you, just, you just put it on the wrong God. This is what Paul is doing. Paul is saying, whoever wrote this was correct. We are God's offspring. You just have the wrong God. It wasn't Zeus. It was Yahweh. It was Jehovah. We are God's children. So instead of, now, this is interesting. Because what most of us have been taught to do we would never do this in our missionary journeys, would we? We were taught, no, you need to rebuke them. Nothing the pagans have is of any value. It's all demonic and satanic. But here we have what Paul is doing. Paul actually says, oh, no, 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 you were actually right. We are his children, and we are indebted to him. You just got the God wrong. It's not Zeus. It's not Zeus. It's the creator. It's the creator God. It's Christ. It's the Father. The Father is the source of all life. So how, how, many of you, how many of you are uncomfortable with that? How many of you are comfortable with that? Comfortable? Good. Good. It gets worse. <laughs> okay, so most people think Paul is only quoting one poet. Paul quotes another poet in the verse. And this poet is Epimenides. Epimenides was a Greek poet and he was a priest of Zeus. Epimenides wrote, a grave has been fashioned for thee, O Zeus, O holy and high one. The lying Cretans, who are all the time liars, evil beasts, idle bellies, but you do not die. For to eternity you live and stand, for in you we live and move and have our being. Isn't that shocking? We, we sing songs about this in church. We've written hymns, we've written worship songs, and we sing, in you we live and move and have our being. And this is based off of a prayer or a hymn praising a false god. 
Is that shocking? This is shocking stuff. So here's the thing. This doesn't bother Paul. This doesn't bother Paul in the slightest because he knows, he knows, you were right. You just got the God wrong. It's in Yahweh that we live and move and have our being. So what Paul is doing is he is going into a culture and he's finding God in the culture. And he's showing the people, he's showing the people, this is how close you are to God. He's in your poetry. He's in your culture, but you're so blinded by the principalities that you don't see him. <laughs> so here's the thing that most, uh, most North Americans don't understand. This is actually how most missionaries operate when they go to, when they go to different countries. For example, um, and I mean, like, this is the way God has always operated. God is a missionary God. Right? Like you think about our main symbol is the cross. Right? Before Jesus, before Jesus, the cross did not symbolize life. It symbolized the most painful death you can imagine. But what happened? What happened is that God took this symbol that symbolized death and he gave them a new way to interpret it through the scriptures through the word of Jesus, through the word of God. So God took something, a, literally, the cross was a pagan symbol, a Roman symbol of death and rebellion. And what God did is he took this symbol and he showed them, look at it in a different way. In churches in Europe, there is, um, there is a symbol, some of you may have seen it, it's, it's, a, it's a connection between three circles or it's kind of like three ovals. And they actually, they, they carve these in the crosses in, in Europe where the Vikings used to be. Because now all the, Vi all, all the lands that used to be Viking, they've all converted to Christianity. And so there's these interesting symbols that, that come through. And so they carve this three circled symbol into their crosses in their churches. And then what they do what they don't tell you is that this symbol used to be a magical symbol in Norse mythology. But what has happened, what has happened is the church took this symbol that used to be rather satanic, and what they've done is they now use it to teach the Trinity, the three circles in one. And they put it in the crosses because the cross is what defines the symbol now. So this is what missionaries do. Missionaries don't, when they, when they go to other cultures, they don't tell them, you need to give up everything you've ever believed in your culture. What they do is they go and they look for connections where we can say, okay, we can see God in this. You don't have to give up everything. Samoan Christians, for example, if, you, if you've ever seen, there's a group called Island Breeze. They do these Samoan dances. And they do this one dance called the warrior dance. Well, in the old Samoan culture, they were warriors, and they would go and they would kill other tribes, and they would do these warrior dances that get themselves, you know, pumped up for battle. And now they do them in worship services, because now they're warriors for Jesus in the spiritual realm. So do you see how there are cultural things that God doesn't need you to give up? You're able to keep your culture the only thing we need to do is we need to look at it through a different lens. Look at it through the lens of Jesus. Because this is how we do missionary work. Yeah, and so I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to close with this. You know, like, like we need to be open to what the Spirit of God is saying to us. Because there are secrets. We have secrets in the Bible that our culture has locked us to, right? And so we need to be open to the Spirit of God showing us, showing us these truths. Now, the way the story ends, the way the story ends is that, is that some of the Greeks believe in the gospel and they come to faith. 
And this is a fascinating thing. The giant, the way, actually, the way the story actually ends is 600 years later when the temple of Athena, who, na, who still stands now, by the way, the temple of Athena, Athena was known as a perpetual virgin. And all of her priests, all of her priestesses, because it was mostly a female religion, they all had to be virgins. In 680, after Christianity was taking over the Roman Empire, the temple to Athena became a church devoted to Mary, the virgin. Later on, later on, they would, in the Dark Ages, they would go to war with the Muslims, and the Muslims would take it, dedicate it to Allah, and now it has been given back to the Greeks, but Paul's preaching of the gospel was so powerful in Athens that right now, if you go to Mars, you can go to Mars Hill in Athens right now. You can go to Mars Hill, and there's actually a plaque with the text of Acts 17. They, act, they literally, there's a Bible verse on Mars Hill dedicated to Ares, a pagan god of war, and on this plaque is Paul's sermon. For God does not dwell in temples made by human hands, as if anybody, as if he needed anything from anybody. For it is him, in him, that we live and move and have our being. So even now, the gospel is still, literally, it's carved in stone. And Greeks go and they read this and they think, because they're still philosophers, and they think. And people come to Christ. Why? Because of the message of the risen Christ. Christ has risen. He's defeated the principalities. So stop giving authority to lesser gods that don't deserve any, any of your attention whatsoever. And so that's the message of, that's the message of, of Marcel. So my encouragement, I'm going to end with this. My encouragement is if there happen to be, if there happen to be, when this airs, if there are any if there are any First Nations people or, Aber, or Aber, Aboriginal people that are hearing this, what I want you to hear is that you don't have to give up your entire culture. God has hidden himself in your culture, and he wants you to find him. He wants you to find him. God has hidden himself in our culture, by the way. God has hidden himself in, in our culture. Every... Uh, this is two minutes and I'll be done, I promise. Every hard-hitting movie within the last five years has had the gospel embedded in the story. Right now, uh, right now in my age group, the Marvel movies are really popular. In almost every Marvel movie, it's based... Sometimes, sometimes the main character is a woman, but usually the main character is an only son. Sometimes in the Thor movie, Thor is the only son of a god. He comes to earth. He gives up his divine powers. He gives up his divine attributes. He gives up his super strength. He gives up his ability to control storms and lightning and the wind. And he sacrifices himself for humans when he didn't have to. And he's resurrected. Do, 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 you see, do you see the gospel? Do you see how even movies, in order to tell a good story, you have to tell the gospel. You have to. And these movies are making money. In, in the big, the, okay, the biggest movie of all time is again a Marvel movie. It's Avengers Endgame. And in the movie, the main villain is Thanos, whose name means death, by the way. And in order to defeat Thanos, Tony Stark, who is an only son, sacrifices himself. He dies. And because he dies, there is a resurrection of the... All of these people that have died in the past movies are all resurrected and they all come back and they end up in this apocalyptic battle, almost as if it's straight out of the book of Revelation. And then death turns into dust and just flies away in the wind. Like, do you understand? 
Do you understand? If you can't see the gospel in these stories, you're not looking, right? And this is what Paul is talking about. In our culture, these movie directors were groping around looking for God, so much so that they're actually telling the gospel and they don't even realize it. They don't even realize it. So this is God. This is God at work. So I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to leave you. I'm going to leave you with this challenge. Look for God in the culture. Don't take culture away from people when we're witnessing to them. Find God in the culture so that we can, so that we can have opportunities to speak to them. Lord God, I thank you. I thank you for this, God. I, just, I pray that you would that you would go out and that you would just minister to these people, Lord. And I, and I pray in the name of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost that you would bless everybody that can hear my voice, that you would love them and you would keep them in your protection and you'd continue to unravel new revelations of who the God of the universe is. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.